Welcome back to the tutorial on coupling techniques for complex control. So I'm going to quickly sort of review the stuff we've covered before moving on to the, the new topics for this part. Um, so what we've been looking at is our techniques for coupling complex systems. So systems with all sorts of moving parts and which are sort of difficult to model or difficult to understand. And but on the other hand, we want to model them and we want to understand and answer some questions about the system. And given how complex they are, it's, it's okay even if we have approximate answers. And the way we are going to do this is come up with an easier system, which hopefully we know how to answer questions about in closed form, um, and then couple these two systems together, typically by having a shared source of randomness. So having the same random events um, affect both these systems. Now, at this point, if the easy system is easy enough, hopefully we know the answers to the questions that we have for the system. And then the so meat of these coupling arguments are in somehow comparing, taking the answer for Y and porting it over to get an approximate answer for X. And what we tried doing in the previous part of the tutorial was come up with some sort of classification for the different coupling techniques which are used commonly in, in control problems. And the way we were doing this classification is on one axis, first explaining how we chose the system Y and how it made X easier. And then on the other axis, trying to explain what were the techniques we used in order to compare the two systems and show that they were close together. So in terms of how we chose easier systems, well, we firstly said, what if we had more information? So what if Y somehow knew more about the future than X? Or what if it had fewer constraints than X? Maybe that was what made the system harder. Um, or what if it had simpler dynamics than the, the more complex system? And on the other hand, on the X axis, we said, well, in many cases, we know systems X and Y completely. We can describe what the sample paths are, and then we can kind of follow these two systems along each sample path and then compare the two of them. Uh, and what we'll be looking at today are cases where even though we know the sample paths, we are really interested in the long-term evolution of these systems. So what happens to these, these settings when we let them, when they're in equilibrium? And the problem is going to be that even though we know what the underlying system is, we don't really know what the, the equilibrium distribution is. So we can characterize properties of this distribution, but we can't just sit and like look at the equilibrium distribution and track it along a sample path and say something about it. So that's basically going to be the, the focus of this next part of the tutorial. But just to remind everyone what we did last time, um, we were looking at the sample path methods. And in particular, we kind of looked at various methods which fell into each of these boxes. So we looked at sort of simple things like MMK versus MM1, and then more complicated things such as Lagrangian relaxations or kind of more interesting ways of simplifying dynamics. Um, and then finally, we had an in-depth section on looking at the compensated coupling and how we could use that to understand online resource allocation. Okay, so I'm going to jump straight into steady state techniques. And in some sense, steady state techniques are going to be somewhat more complicated because we know less about the, the underlying distribution which we are trying to understand. Um, and, and the way we're going to do it is first give a high level in like high level insight into certain very widely used techniques for doing steady state. In coupling and then go into one particular example in more detail. And that's the example of the Gittins index for MGK policies. And just as last time, we're gonna again start off with the MMKQ. Um, we already saw one way of doing a steady state coupling in order to try and say something about the, the expected number of people in the MMKQ. Um, in this, now what we want to do is we want to look at the same system, but try and say something about this in steady state. So we're letting the MMKQ run till for a large amount of time until it's in equilibrium. And we want to say, we want to measure properties of its equilibrium distribution X infinity. So this is the steady state distribution of the MMK. Now the MMK system is, uh, it's a fairly easy Markov chain. It's quasi reversible. So we actually know what X infinity is in closed form, but for a moment, let's, Let's pretend we have no idea of what this distribution is. Um, one thing we do know is that the distribution has supports on the has support in the natural numbers. So if I looked at the CDF of X infinity, 
I know this would be a step function with jumps at each of the natural numbers. So how can we simplify this? Well, maybe you decide that you don't like working with discrete distributions or like these sort of step functions with the CDN. So maybe it would be nice to somehow approximate the steady state distribution, which something which is just continuous, so which has a PDF and the CDF is smooth everywhere. Um, so kind of pictorially, what we want to do is something like this. There's some weird underlying step distribution. We know properties of it. We don't know how to write down what the distribution is exactly. Um, we want to come up with some other distribution, y infinity, which is which is easier to write down and which we can we can say how far it is from x infinity. And indeed, for the MMK, this can be done. So here's a plot from this paper by Braverman, Dai, and Feng, where what they're looking at is a sort of piecewise approximation of the of the exact distribution for the MMK. Um, and this has been centered. And if you squint carefully, you'll see that there's another PDF which has been drawn on top, which is actually a continuous PDF. And so this is what they are calling the, the, the diffusion approximation in this setting. Um, and so this is a MMK where K is equal to 250. And you can see that the two are actually very closely agreed. So how exactly do you come up with something like this? And, and the magic behind this, this plot, as the, the title of the paper suggests, is this idea of using Stein's method. Now, we can do a tutorial on just Stein's method alone. In fact, there are excellent tutorials available by, by Jim Dye, amongst others. Um, and we are going to somehow try and do that in five minutes. So clearly, there will be some compression. Um, but I want to give you a high level sense of what exactly is going on in this method. So. For any Stein's method calculation, there are kind of two core underlying ingredients. Um, and the first one is this idea that if you want to compare two distributions, well, you want to sort of, one way of doing that is taking some metrics or some sort of distance between distributions and seeing that the distributions are close in the metric. And most metrics or like any metric that you take, they, it often, they often have a certain variational characterization associated with them. So instead of thinking of the metric in terms of a distance, you can think of the metric in terms of what I've written on the right, which is the worst case difference between expectations under these two distributions, um, the worst case over some test class of functions. And for example, if we were looking, if H was the set of all functions which are bounded in the infinity norm, so bounded between minus one and one, um, and if you could say something about the supremum of the difference between these expectations under two different distributions, then what you would get is what's called the total variation distance. So th this is in fact the variational dis description of the total variation distance. And as an aside, the way you actually prove the two are equal is the easiest proof is through, through couplings. In fact, this is you know, one of the canonical uses of couplings. Um, Similarly, if we were looking at H being the set of all uh, Lipschitz one functions, then the corresponding distance between distributions that you get is the Wasserstein one distance. And for any other sort of distance function that you take, there's typically a variational characterization in terms of a set of test functions which you can use to compare them. Okay, so this is just a definition about, about distances between distributions. Um, the problem is if we wanted to use something like this, and let's say we wanted X to be the steady state distribution of some complicated Markov chain, well, we don't really know what the steady state distribution is. So it's not obvious how we would plug it in and do something with it. So here's the second ingredient that Stein suggests, which helps us get around this problem, which is that instead of thinking about distributions, um, you can take any distribution and relate it to what's called a characterizing operator. So what is this? Well, so this is a functor. It's, it's a function over the space of functions where um, I'm sort of denoting here by script A. And what this does is um, if you pass any function G within a certain class, it sort of morphs the function in a certain way. So what do I mean by this? Um, consider the following example. And this is actually Stein's original example, which is if you look at the operator, so given any function g, if you look at the operator which converts g to g prime x minus x g x, assuming g is differentiable, um, then if if you now like take a normal distribution and plug it into this operator and then take expectations, if you take expectation of a of g of capital X where x is normal, then this is always going to be zero. 
and in some sense this is like a signature for a normal distribution if you if you have a distribution and you didn't know it was normal and then you sort of threw it into this this operator for any test fun for any function g um, and you saw that this was zero then you would know that you have a normal distribution now that's nice this like what people usually do in Stein's method is they take different distributions and actually find this kind of characterizing operator. And so the natural question to ask is, well, if I have a steady state distribution of the Markov chain, of any Markov chain, um, what is the characterizing operator for that setting? And this turns out to have a, a surprisingly simple answer. So let me first show you what the characterizing operator is for a birth death chain. So suppose I have some birth death chain and Suppose it has birth rate lambda k and death rate mu k in state k. Then it turns out that the correct characterizing operator for this chain is you look at lambda x times g of x plus one plus mu x times g of x minus one minus g of x. Essentially, you start off at some state x and take one step according to this Markov chain and then look at sort of g after you take the step minus g before you take the step. And it's kind of easy to see if you just think about the definition of a steady state distribution that the expected value of this operator for the steady state distribution is zero for any function g that we put in as any decent function, which is not sort of going up to infinity. And more generally, if you have any steady state Markov chain, oh, sorry, if you have any Markov chain and the Markov chain has some sort of associated generator, if this is a continuous time Markov chain, or, um, but you can also define this for discrete time or even like continuous time, continuous space settings. Um, what you can show is that if you, the, the characterizing operator for this, the steady state distribution is always just applying the generator to this function g of x. So the generator is this, you can think of it as this massive matrix, this g of x is this massive vector, you're just taking this, this linear transformation. Okay, so now we have our characterizing operator for the Markov chain steady state distribution. And here is kind of the magic of Stein's method. So what Stein says is, well, we want to try and bound the distance between some steady state distribution x infinity and some, some distribution y of our own choice. It's a candidate distribution which we feel is close to what x infinity is. Well, firstly, we know that y has a characterizing operator a y. And now what we're gonna do is we, we somehow want to bound h of x minus h of y expectation. If you could do that, if you could bound that over all test functions, we would get a bound for the, the distance between x and y. And what we're gonna do is instead of working with h directly, which is our test function, we're gonna take h and find a new function f which satisfies this equation. So this is some functional equation where h is an input to it and f is an output. So you give me any test function h, I'm gonna give you some new function f which comes out of this. And in the particular case of if A turned out, if A was the, the generator of a Markov chain, this would be what's called the Poisson equation for this Markov chain. But in general, you give me any operator, I can define this equation. Why is this useful? Well, I can take expectation on both sides. And as soon as I do that, I get something like this. So I'm gonna take expectation with Z being set as X infinity. And you can see on the left I'm, uh, or on the right side, I'm basically getting the expectation, uh, the expected value of h of x infinity minus h of y. On the other side, I, I started off with uh, this operator a y applied to f of x infinity. And for free, I can just subtract the operator a x applied to f of x infinity, because that's the characterizing operator for x infinity. And now if these two operators happen to be close, then I can control the right-hand side. So this is what is called generator coupling, or at least what Di Braverman et al. called generator coupling. The idea is that we are taking this, this characteristic equation of this time, uh, of, of this time method, um, and then we are, even though we have this x infinity, which we don't know how to talk about, we know what the characterizing operator, so we know what the, generating, uh, the generator of the Markov chain is. We also know the characterizing operator for y, and we somehow choose it in such a way that ay and ax kind of cancel out for most things. And once that happens, then even though you don't know what x infinity is, you can somehow you can still control what the error is, and this will give you a bound on hx minus hy for any test function h. Uh, and once you do that, you get a distance between these two. 
Okay, so there's a lot being hidden under the rug over here, and, and there's a, a lot of work in doing this generator coupling business over here, but at a high level, the main idea is going through this. Like Once we understand that we want to work with the generators, we can somehow try to bound it over all functions H and the, the corresponding F and over any distribution X. And once we get that, we get bounds on this process. All right, so, so that was Stein's method. And it's kind of clear that Stein's method falls in this set of simpler dynamics. We, in fact, we are not even simplifying the dynamics, we are simplifying kind of the end goal of the dynamics, the, the sort of steady state distribution that comes about as a result of this. And so now we still have two boxes left, and for that, I'm gonna hand it over to Ziz. So, um, our next example has to do with load balancing systems. Um, so, um, and this is gonna be a specific example of something called state space collapse and the drift method. So I'll get to that in a bit, but I'm first gonna tell you about the specific load balancing problem. So let's say that we are um, load balancing in a, in a queuing system where I've got exponential job sizes. So I've got um, some number of servers K, each of them has speed mu service rate mu over K. And I've got jobs arriving at rate lambda. And so this gives the system load row equals lambda over mu. That's the total arrival rate divided by the total service rate. Um, and so whenever a job arrives, I have to choose which queue I'm gonna, uh, which server I'm gonna dispatch it to. Um, and then once the ser once each server is going in first come first serve order, not that it matters because things are exponential, um, and, and jobs can't move between servers once they've been dispatched. And so, and we're saying, say we're trying to dispatch to like minimize uh, mean response time or equivalently minimizes the number of jobs in the system, right? This is you know, kind of first, first thing we might think to minimize. And the first policy we might think to do is let's spread the jobs out as evenly as possible. That seems like a great idea. And, that, and the policy that does this most naturally is called JSQ, join the sources queue. Always dispatches to the server with the fewest jobs uh, in, present right now. And uh, JSQ systems definitely co qualify as these scary, sad face orange complex systems. Even with just two servers, um, the JSQ uh, results in a kind of famously difficult two-dimensional Markov chain. Um, at least it's famously difficult uh, for like people who take Moore's class, uh, where you know you learn about all sorts of you know different queuing systems and different Markov chains. And JSQ has this like really scary uh, infinite triangle Markov chain. Um, there is some like very interesting work that kind of gets at analyzing this two-server version. But you know when you add, start adding servers, you start adding dimensions. Uh, it becomes intractable uh, to do for like general k. Um, so JSQ is a complex system. Um, so we might think, okay, what's an easier system we might compare this uh, you know, load balancing system to? And continuing a theme that we uh, seen uh, saw yesterday, we're gonna compare to a single server system with the same total capacity. Um, so in this case, an MM1 with one server of speed mu and the same arrival rate lambda is a simple lower bound. Uh, that is to say, this MM1 is kind of strictly more efficient than the JSQ system. So the kind of big idea is we're going to uh, try and couple this JSQ system to the MM1 system. Um, and so what I'm going to tell you about today, I'm going to sketch um, sketch a paper uh, by uh, by Ariel Maz and Srikant. And this paper actually uh, treats a discrete time system. So some of the details I'm going to tell you about today are a bit different, um, but the kind of basic ideas are the same. So we're comparing a JSQ system versus an MM1 system. And um, it's pretty clear, I'm not going to go through it in detail, that the MM1 system has, um, in, in fact, not just lower in expectation, but stochastically, low, stochastically fewer um, jobs than the JSQ system, which you can prove using a coupling argument. Um, okay, so, but that's the easy direction, right? The lower bound is pretty obvious. What we really want is we want to somehow use this easy MM1 system to get an upper bound on, on the JSQ system. And the overall intuition is that um, because JSQ is like doing a really good job of keeping the servers busy, most, you know, as long as there's not like, as long as there's like some reasonable number of jobs in the system, 
then JSQ is going to have all the servers be busy. And so the JSQ system is going to be humming along, serving jobs at rate mu, just like the MM1. And so what one can show um, in the paper, they show an analog of this for discrete time, um, but using a different method, which I'll actually mention later in this tutorial, one can show that the an expression that tells you what the uh, number of jobs in the K server system is, this uh, E of NK, um, in terms of this, in terms of E of N1 and this complicated quantity. Um, let's see if I can, yeah. And this complicated quantity, um, which in particular has an NK in it. So it's not just E of NK, right? It's E of NK uh, times something. And this, uh, and uh, this, this B variable, I'm sorry, I have omitted the speech bubble defining it. So B is the fraction of servers that are busy. So this is a fraction between zero and one. When B is one, that means all the servers are busy. When B is zero, that means all the servers are idle. So one minus B is, you can think of as the fraction of servers that are idle. And so, and so we have this weird product of fraction of idle servers times number of jobs in the system. And it's a, not really obvious how to deal with that. Um, so what, um, what this uh, 2012 paper shows is that um, this weird expression, uh, after some manipulations, you can bound by the following expression. Um, the square root of the expected variance of Q lengths, I'll explain what that is a bit more on the next slide, over 1 minus rho. And so this is promising because E of n1, um, you know, it's we're talking about an mm1. Uh, it's it scales as one over one minus rho. Um, so if we can get plus something like square root one over one minus rho, uh, that's a kind of nice upper bound. And so um, and in fact, that's exactly what we're going to show. Um, and the way we're going to show that is using a technique called state space collapse. So um, I'm going to. I'm going to describe a kind of way to talk about the state space of the system. Um, you, you can, in fact, describe the state space with this vector um, Q, which basically has each, in, each entry of Q is the number of jobs at a particular server. So I'm making the definitions in general on the left, and then I'm drawing the special case of two, on the, of two uh, servers on the right. So, uh, Q we can think of as the sy system state vector. And, um, and so we can decompose this vector into two parts. Um, they're usually called uh, Q parallel and Q, and Q perpendicular. I'll get to Q perpendicular in a second. So Q parallel, um, you can think of as a vector that's pointing in the sort of all ones direction. So it's in this case, it's equal parts Q1 and Q2. And its length, is the average number of jobs per server. And I like to think of this Q, Q, Q parallel as the MMM, I'm sorry, as the MM1 part of the state. So like uh, an MM1, right, its state is one dimensional. You're just thinking about the number of jobs in the system. So the, I, I like to visualize the MM1 state lives on this, on the kind of uh, line pointed along by this blue vector. And the orange system is more complicated because it doesn't just stay on the line, right? It can go off of the line. And uh, we can describe exactly how far the orange vector is off of the line with the other component, uh, which we call Q perp uh, or Q perpendicular. Um, and, and, and when I was talking about variance of Q lengths earlier, uh, what I really mean is the, uh, uh, the squared norm of Q perp. And so, um, and just to kind of connect this picture back to the number of jobs in the system, right? I've already said that Q parallel is, uh, uh, is kind of length average number of jobs per server. And so the length of uh, Q per is exactly NK over K. Sorry, uh, length of Q parallel. So this orange vector Q is the general state space of the system. We can de decompose it into these two parts, a simple MM1 part, Q parallel, and a kind of uh, trickier to handle Q perpendicular. 
And so what we what uh, what we what we'd like to do at a high level to say that uh, our JSQ system is kind of closely approximated by the M1 system. That basically amounts to saying that this Q perpendicular vector is small. And so uh, this is exactly the method uh, that, uh, that is pioneered in this paper. It's called the drift method. And it shows this uh, property called state space collapse. Um, so the drift method basically, they use a Lyapunov function to show that the, this variance of Q lengths is bounded by a constant which is independent of load. And so, um, and so what this means is that if you kind of, if the, if the Q length uh, gets really, really big, right, if it gets all the way out here, um, the uh, amount that we expect to deviate from this kind of line, Q1 equals Q2, is always bounded by a constant. So if the load gets really high, we get like really far out, but we're always like really hovering just around here. And in particular, we're never hitting the case where one server is empty while another isn't. Um, and it's those cases when like some but not all servers are idle. Uh, those are exactly the cases where, um, JS, where JSQ can kind of lose out compared to the MM1. OK. And so and in particular, by the formula on the previous slide, if given, uh, the, uh, given this property of Q perp using the Lyapunov enough function, uh, it immediately implies that the number in the JSQ system is bounded by the number in the JS1 in the in the MM1 system plus a, a function more slowly growing than one over one minus rho. Um, in particular, that is smaller than e of n. So this implies a sort of heavy traffic optimality property of JSQ, um, which is maybe intuitive, but this is a nice formal way to show that um, through a like relatively elegant method of this cou coupling argument. Um, the paper you know, still has lots of details, but this is the kind of key idea. And um, if you and so this this method has been applied to like lots more systems than just JSQ. Um, in particular, it's had lots of use in various types of switch scheduling, where uh, switch scheduling is where you've got um, where basically at every moment in time, you're it's sort of rather than just making dispatching decisions, you have to sort of make routing decisions where you route like some number of input messages to some number of output queues. And so you have to actually give a matching from inputs to outputs at every moment in time. So it kind of is a much more complicated uh, type of problem. Uh, but this uh, drift method and state space collapse method um, have seen great success in switch, switch scheduling and more. And in fact, there's another Sigmetrics tutorial this year um, being given by Magalur and Chen and so you should check that out if you want to hear more about the drift method. When we're kind of trying to put this state space collapse kind of into our classification, um, the, way I think, the way I think of it is we're comparing against an MM1 system, which is kind of a less constrained version of the JSQ system, right? Uh, rather than having to commit to serving a job on a particular server, we can just use the full server for whatever job happens to be in the system. And we're able to show that the JSQ system is close to the MM1 system, not by kind of following exactly what happens you know, with every single job, but by showing that the distribution of the JSQ system is close to that, to that kind of center uh, blue, ar blue arrow line. Um, and so it is an inherently a steady state distribution property rather than a sample path property, um, at least you know, with the techniques that we know so far. It's possible that another technique could give a sample path coupling. That's, in fact, true for everything in column B, right? It's possible someone could have come up with the sample path argument uh, some later date. But for now, this is what we know. The next thing I'm going to talk about is a kind of another example of uh, I'm going to get into my in-depth example about multi-server scheduling. So it's another multi-server queuing system example. But before we move on with that, any questions about the drift method um, uh, and state space collapse? What happens if k grows? What happens if k grows? So um, in this expression, uh, I hid this. I hid some k's inside this little o. Um, I don't know off the top of my head exactly um, exactly what the dependence on k is. Um, I think it might be linear in k, but I'm not. 
I'm not totally sure off the top of my head. Um, so, but but basically, you can uh, the the paper has a more explicit expression that also talks about the dependence in k, and so it's pretty easy to say, well, if k and load are scaling at this rate together, then you still have heavy traffic optimality. Um, but if the kind of number of servers scales way faster, um, then you're not going to have heavy traffic optimality. And that makes sense, right? If you have like a really light load, but a ton, a ton of server, but you just like have more and more servers, because we're looking at like super tiny servers, um, uh, our jobs are just going to take longer and longer. I see. So we don't expect heavy, we don't expect like to be close all the time. Um, yeah, but you're right, you can, there is a condition you can write down on K and row that would give this. I guess maybe as one additional thing that I think there's a paper by laying on, like, so this is assuming a certain regime of K, but like in other regimes, you can do similar styles of arguments to show um, these kind of results. So there are regimes where basically all queues are almost always empty, and so JSQ is like has completely different behavior. And there are papers looking at that. So if you have some, uh, if I have something other than JSQ, we in my we should couple it with something else, not necessary MM. So I my understanding is that this method has also been used for things like power to choices and so on. Um, so at least when you're looking at heavy traffic and, you know, K not growing too fast or staying constant, then coupling with the MM1 is the right thing to do. Um, in cases like when Sid mentioned where, uh, K is staying, is staying constant or sorry, when K is growing way faster than load, those are cases where the MM1 just isn't the right approximating system. Um, and there you want to couple with something other than the MM1. Um, Sid, am I getting that right? I think yeah, for the case that K, K increasing for Lane's paper, uh, then you can, uh, you should use the stand, uh, stand method. Uh, you can characterize right. the, the approximation error uh, with a gap to the mean field approximation. Question, which is when I see you have this Low balancing problem with K servers, I would think we should couple it with MMK. Uh, but uh, is that a sensible thing? That's a good question. That seems like it should work. Um, I don't think you'd get an appreciably different result here because, like, this argument that we carried out, right? Uh, at least if we're kind of just looking for what's the one over one minus row term, it's going to be the same for the MMK and the MM1. Um, because we know that we know from the first part of this tutorial that the MMK differs from the MM1 by at most K minus one. Um, um, but you're right that maybe if you were looking at a more fine grained way, uh, I think coupling against the MMK should work. All right, so let's get to the second part of today which is going to be an in-depth study of uh, steady state coupling, specifically about the Gittins policy in the MGK. And so this is work, um, uh, joint work with Isaac, who is in the audience, and our advisor, Moore Harkel Balter. And it's actually, uh, it appeared just barely in 2020, but it, we're presenting it at uh, this year's Sigmetrics. Uh, so if you want to read more about this, you can, uh, the, the paper is online. If you want to hear less about this than you will hear today, you can watch the Sigmetrics video. Um, uh, and if you want to hear more about it, you can keep watching. So I'm going to start by kind of just defining the model carefully, uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page. So, so far for the survey, I've been kind of pretty fast and loose with like, I mean, describing the model at a high level. I'm going to take some time to go through the details a bit to make sure uh, that, you know, if we're going to spend you know, 50 minutes analyzing something, I want to make sure we all understand it first. So I'm going to start by defining the MG1 queue. So this is something that many of you have probably heard of, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, the MG1 queue is a classic single server queuing system with a single server and a queue that can hold any number of jobs waiting for service. And so I'm going to draw jobs as test tubes. So a, um, a, te a 
the height of a test tube represents the job size. That's the amount of time it needs for service. And we're going to represent that service as filling the job with water. And so we're going to call the amount of service a job has received so far its age. Um, note that this refers to its service age rather than its system age. So the service age only goes up while the job's in service. Um, and then the rest of the job, uh, its size minus age is just its remaining size. That's the amount of work left. So we've got jobs randomly arriving over time. And the specific type of arrival process is, is what the M and the G stand for. So um, we have some general size distribution, S, not necessarily just exponential. We have some arrival rate lambda, and that gives the system load rho equals lambda times E of S. And of course, uh, load has to be less than one for stability. And we're studying scheduling today. So the scheduling policy picks at every moment in time which job to serve. And we're specifically looking at preemptive scheduling, where we can, at any moment in time, switch which job is in service and start serving a new job with no delay or loss of work or other overhead. So that's preemptive scheduling in the MG1. And our kind of goal metric is going to be response time, which is the time, just the time from when a job arrives to the system to when it leaves. And the response time of the queue, even though we're just at one server, it's going to be greatly impacted by the scheduling policy. And our goal is going to be to minimize the mean response time over all jobs, um, which by Little's law is equivalent to minimizing the mean uh, number of jobs in system. So we're going to mention that a few times as well. So um, again, this is probably background you've all seen before, but uh, just to kind of bring everyone up to speed, let's say we're scheduling with known job sizes. So we have the scheduler has perfect knowledge of the system. It can see every job's um, exact size, exact age, exact remaining size. And we're trying to minimize mean response time. The policy that does the best in this setting, that, does, that gets the optimal mean response time, is one called SRPT. This stands for shortest remaining processing time. And what it does is it always serves the job of least remaining size. The intuition here is that, um, again, because minimizing mean response time is the same as minimizing the mean number in the system, what you want to do at every moment in time is decrease the number of jobs in your system um, as quickly as possible. Uh, I like to think of it as like each job is a hole in your wallet and you're like draining money through the holes in your wallet. And the quick, the hole that you can stitch up the quickest is the one you should work on first so that you stop losing money. Um, and so that's exactly what SRPT does. And it's not too hard to show that SRPT minimizes mean response time. This was shown by Shraga in 1968. Um, so scheduling gets a lot more complicated if you don't know job sizes. So if you don't know job sizes, um, then you know, obviously you can't do SRPT. Um, right? Because if you don't know sizes, then you don't know remaining sizes. So uh, what should we do if we don't have known sizes, we have unknown sizes? Maybe even more basic of a question. What should we do, like, or what information is even available to us when we're scheduling with unknown sizes? So there's one piece of information that's kind of immediately clear from the slide, which is we can see each job's age. And this makes sense because Remember, a job's age is the amount of time it's been served so far. So we can just measure that. So it's easy, it's fine to assume that we know each job's age. It's also reasonable to assume that even if we don't know any particular job size, we might well still know the overall distribution of job sizes. The intuition here is that, you know, um, you know, again, because we can measure how long a job takes, once a job finishes, we have learned what its size was. And so by keeping historical data, we'll get a good idea of what the distribution of job sizes is. And so scheduling with unknown job sizes basically amounts to using this, the ages of each job and the overall size distribution S in order to make a smart scheduling decision. And the policy that does this best is one called the Gittins policy. And the way Gittins works, I'll talk about it a bit more on the next slide, but it, it assigns each job a rank or priority based on that job's age and the size distribution S. And the, we're going to use the convention that lower is better. You'll also often see Gittins presented as uh, a Gittins index where the higher index is better. 
So rank and index are reciprocals. So for the rest of this talk, we're going to say Gittins assigns each job a rank, lower rank is better. So Gittins always serves the job of minimum rank at every moment in time. In this case, this, this, this is the job of rank three. Note that like the rank doesn't need to be monotonic in the age, right? This, uh, this job has the uh, largest age, it has rank three. Um, this one has the least age, it has rank four. But then this one uh, has rank higher than both of them, even though it has an intermediate age. So that can totally happen uh, with um, when you've got general job size distributions. Uh, we'll see an example of that actually on the next slide. Okay, and the proof is much more involved than SRPT, but one can show that Gittins minimizes mean response time in this setting with unknown sizes. So on the next slide, I'm going to walk through um, a kind of example of what Gittins looks like for a particular job size distribution. So I like to visualize the Gittins policy is is as constructing rank as a function of age. So remember that rank is priority, where lower is better. And um, I'm going to I'm going to show you what Gittins looks like for my favorite job size distribution, where all jobs are either size 1, 6, or 14, each with one third probability. So the general formula for the Gittins rank function is this thing. And I'm not going to spend that much time talking about this thing. I might gesture at it a few times. Um, but what I'm instead going to mostly point out is this picture. So um, this picture is what this formula tells us for the particular job size distribution S, 1, 6, or 14. So there are a few things I want to point out about the Gissons rank function to kind of help us get an intuition for it. So the first is that if we look between ages 6 and 14, we see we actually have a line going down at slope 1. And so um, and what's really happening is that when a job size is known, its rank is just its remaining size. Um, and so once a job passes, you know, once a job passes age six, right, we know it's not size one because we passed age one. We know it's not age six because it was size six because we passed age six, which means it must be size 14. So once we're between ages six and 14, we know the job size. So its rank is just its remaining size. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that, um, is that kind of right before each of these points, six and one, the Gittins rank drops to zero. And the intuition here is that, well, let's say, let's say we've got a job at age, um, you know, uh, 5.9. Uh, if we've got a job at age 5.9, then there's a 50-50 chance that it will finish after just 0.1 seconds of service. And so even though this job doesn't actually have remaining size, just 0.1, we have a really good chance of finishing it if we give it 0.1 seconds of our time. And so, um, and so what the, the Gittins rank we actually end up giving it is, uh, is ends up not being 0.1, but ends up being 0.2. So this line right before age six has slope two, which corresponds to the fact that there's a 50-50 chance of finishing at age six, conditional on uh, being uh, size six or 14. Similarly, uh, just before age one, this line has slope three, because you've got a one third chance of finishing at age one. Um, and if you stare at this formula, you'll see, oh, hey, there's this probability in the bottom. And that's kind of where that, those slopes are coming from. Um, so that's a kind of intuition for the Gittins rank function, um, at least a little bit. Um, so it, if. Uh, the, most of the details about the Gittins rank function actually aren't going to be a big focus of this talk, but I wanted to spend some time to introduce it, given that I'm going to tell you all about it for the next uh, for the next while. So, um, so that's the Gittins policy, which minimizes mean response time in the MG1. Um, and in fact, you can think of uh, Gittins is more general than I'm showing you right now. Right now, I'm kind of saying, oh, a job size is completely unknown. Gittins also works when you have partial information. In fact, the fact that you have rank equals remaining size when size is known, uh, that's really a hint that SRPT is, a, is kind of a version of Gittins. Um, and if you read our paper, we kind of explain exactly why that is. OK, so that's the Gittins policy, minimizes mean response in the, in the MG1. 
So the MG1 is the simple system that we know how to solve. It's you know, maybe harder than some of the systems we've talked about already, but there's a, a known solution. Let's now talk about the MGK, which is a much more complicated system, as hinted by the orange font. So the MGK is basically like the MG1, except we've got K servers instead of just one. And we're going to do the kind of same trick we've been doing this whole tutorial, which is we're going to give each of these servers speed 1 over K so that we still have the same total service capacity. So we're going to use the same definition of size distribution, same definition of arrival rate, same definition of load. We still need load less than 1 for stability. Um, but now, kind of when a job runs on a server, if it's got size s, it will take k times s time to complete, because that server is running at speed 1 over k. So that's MGK. And um, the other thing that changes with the MGK is our scheduling policy um, now has to pick k jobs to serve. Um, if there are fewer than k jobs, obviously, we can just serve all of them. But in particular, uh, if we've got more than k jobs, we can't decide to like, you know, pool the servers together. Um, we, I, um, I like to think of this as a constraint. We have to serve, have to split our capacity between k separate jobs. Now, we can still think about uh, SRPT and Gittins in this system. So for example, multi-server Gittins would serve the k jobs with the k lowest ranks. Multi-server SRPT would serve the k jobs with the k least remaining sizes. And so you could still imagine doing SRPT and Gittins in the MGK. And so the big question is, are SRPT and Gittins good policies in the MGK? Because um, you know, we don't know what the optimal policy is in the MGK. So um, as you can probably see by now, what we're gonna, the coupling we're going to be constructing is going to compare the MGK to the MG1. And so remember, the MGK has uh, k servers of speed it should be should say one over k, and similarly mg1 has one server of speed one. And we've got the same arrival rate uh, lambda and job size distribution s arriving at both of these systems. And so um, I've already told you that in the mg1 SRPT and Gittins uh, achieve optimal mean response time in their respective settings. So SRPT is optimal when you know sizes, Gittins is optimal when you don't know sizes. Um, and as a reminder, response time is the amount of time it takes uh, for a job to go through the system. All right, and so the big question is, are SRPT and Gittins, well, we're not, be, we're not gonna be able to show optimality. In fact, um, I think Isaac has some work basically showing, demonstrating that SRPT is suboptimal in the MGK. Um, but we might still hope to show that SRPT and Gittins are near optimal in the MGK. So, um, so this type of coupling, as you've uh, probably figured out by now, we, uh, we're, I'm, I like to think of it as um, the MG1 is a less constrained version of the MGK, right? Because I don't have to split up my service capacity. So this is going to be a kind of type two coupling with fewer constraints. And so um, we have, we have, we've actually uh, been working on this problem of MGK scheduling for several years now, and the first paper we published about it was at Performance in 2018, where we actually gave a sample path coupling that showed that SRPT was near optimal in the MGK. However, the technique we used kind of really relied, really relied on the fact that we had known job sizes. And the way it works is it kind of combined um, some, some classic queuing theory analysis of SRPT with some, uh, with some of the worst case theoretical theoretical computer science style scheduling literature that looked at multi-server SRPT. It combined ideas from both of them um, to basically construct the sample path coupling that showed uh, a type of near optimality in the MGK. And so, uh, what we, and so we actually tried for a while to get that same sort of trick to work for Gittins. Um, and we, we actually published a paper where we like kind of really tried hard and we got some partial results, but it just it, it's not the right way to do it. And so what I'm going to tell you about in the rest of this tutorial is a new way of coupling the MG1 to the MGK that rather than being uh, sample path based is steady state based. And it will work both for SRPT and Gittins. So I'm going to focus a lot on uh, for simplicity. I'm going to talk a lot about how this works for SRPT. But I want to emphasize that it works for both SRPT and Gittins. 
And even though the SRPT results we've kind of already shown using a sample path technique, um, I want to showcase the new technique with kind of as little new machinery as possible. Thus, a lot of the focus will be on SRPT. OK, so here's the kind of result we prove for Gittins and MGK, and is kind of what I mean by near optimal. What we show is that um, the mean response time in the MGK, that's this ETK, is upper bounded by mean response time in the MG1, plus this slowly growing function of load, log 1 over 1 minus rho. Um, so, if you so if you think about like the M, the case where job sizes are exponential, we know that ET one uh, looks like one over one minus rho. So this log is really really small uh, compared to that. Um, it turns out that for like uh, Pareto job size distributions, uh, when you have like infinite variance, um, you can actually have ET one also be order of log. Um, so, but what we were able to show is that, uh, and this is uh, leaning heavily on some prior work. Um, analyzing uh, the MG1 and heavy traffic, but we were able to leverage that prior work to show that this kind of uh, this log bound implies heavy traffic optimality, namely that the MGK approaches this lower bound of the MG1 as load approaches one capacity. We were able to show that under a condition which is like just a tiny bit stronger than finite variance. Uh, right, this is not quite finite second moment, it's finite, anything slightly bigger than second moment. So, uh, so these are the results we were able to show. And, and, and so the kind of main difficulty is figuring out how to couple the MGK uh, to, the, uh, to the MG1. Or, so we know we're going to you know, give them the same arrival processes, um, but the question but the question is, how do we translate the fact that they have the same arrival processes into having similar response times? And, um, and so what I'm going to tell you about uh, in, the rest of, in basically the rest of today is a new idea, which we call our work, which is a kind of new way of looking at queuing systems. Uh, well, depending on how you think about it, it's either an old way or a new way. It, this has kind of shown up a bunch of times in the past in different guises. We're kind of putting it in, uh, we're kind of trying to make it clear. Um, and by clarifying it, we were actually able to prove uh, much more general results than it has, has been done in the past. So using this new concept of our work, we were able to show that uh, these queues had similar mean response time performance. Any questions about uh, these types of results um, before we move on uh, to kind of how we get there? Are the results as you've written them true, even if k and rho are changing together? Yes, so this big O is hiding an explicit expression that depends on the job size distribution. Um, and in the paper, we've published one such expression. In kind of preliminary work, we've uh, kind of hacked away at it and gotten it to be slightly better. In particular, you can replace this big O with something like E plus 2 or something. Uh, and so like you, there is actually a universal constant that you can put here. Um, this isn't published, that that's not yet published uh, because it's, but, um, uh, and you can also get things like if you have light tail distributions, you can actually replace the big O with a little O and with an explicit expression to do with the tail of this distribution. Um, so, so this is actually an explicit bound. Under like one of these, you know, QED scalings or something like that, where it's like the number of servers and the load are kind of scaling. So rho is like yeah we have you have you thought about how that what this bound looks like so there? we haven't we haven't ex, we haven't explicitly thought about it but all the tools exist in the literature between uh, our bounds and some bounds in prior work uh, on the MG one and heavy traffic um, and there might be a little bit a little bit further that it can be pushed. Um, uh, okay, but yeah, it's not something we've been discussed in depth, but it's. Definitely right fruit right for picking. Okay, all right. So let's maybe get started with uh, pro with proving these results, or at least showing the key ideas behind the proof. So I'm going to start with this uh, concept of our work. So, uh, so just normal work, no R involved. The work in a queuing system is just the total remaining size of all jobs currently present in the system. Our work is going to be a sort of 
uh, a subset of that work in the queuing system. So our work, which we're going to write as W of R, uh, in the, when we're talking about a system using SRPT, our work is the total remaining size of all jobs, but only counting the ones that have remaining size below R. So um, the way I like to uh, picture this is I put on kind of size R sunglasses that um, hide anybody who's not cool enough uh, for me to see uh, with size R below. So uh, these, so the total remaining size of all the jobs that I see through the glasses, that's the R work in the system. So that's the SRPT definition. The definition for Gittins is similar, but it's a little bit more complicated because um, jobs ranks can go up and down. So I'm now going to explain what R work is for Gittins. So again, work is just total remaining size of all jobs. And R work is going to be, roughly speaking, the work that is relevant to a given rank R. And by this, I mean it's the amount of work that a job needs until it either completes or its rank jumps above R. Because once, it, and once a job jumps above rank R, we're going to say it's no longer relevant to rank R. It's, um, you know, I'm too cool for it. I don't care about it anymore if I'm rank R. So pictorially, uh, let's say this is the rank function for a size distribution we're talking about. And this is the rank, the, this is the cut of R we're talking about. If a job uh, kind of starts at age zero and has size big enough that it doesn't complete anytime soon, then its R work would be this amount. So at least that would be the R work of a single job. And so then um, if I'm looking at a whole queuing system and I look at the kind of ranks of all the jobs in the queuing system, uh, I get the total R work of the queuing system by putting on my rank R sunglasses and basically asking how much work needs to happen for all of the jobs I can currently see to either leave the system or become invisible by exceeding rank R. So, um, and if you, uh, in a, this is in a certain sense a kind of natural generalization of the SRPT definition of R work. Because in, in, under SRPT, right, a job's remaining size only goes down. A job only looks better and better as you serve it. So you don't have this extra case of exceeding rank R. Right, because jobs only will once you see a job, it will it will definitely complete. Uh, it will never go invisible. In general, in Gittins, you can also have this going invisible. But once you account for that, you get basically the uh, analogous definition of R work. One thing I should clarify is um, here R is a free parameter. It can be anything bigger than zero, and we're basically going to uh, be looking. I'm going to talk about like the R work a lot. Um, but what I really mean is we're going to think about kind of the R work for all possible values of R. Um, and we're going to kind of, uh, and uh, we're going to see exactly uh, why that is in a couple of slides. So here's how we get response time via R work. So again, we're trying to uh, relate the mean response time in the MGK to that in the MG1. And we're going to do this by going via R work. So the first step is we're going to relate mean response time to mean R work in a very general way. And this is going to work, uh, get a relationship for both the MGK and the MG1, and actually in more general queuing systems. So I'll talk a bit about that uh, when we get there. So that's, just, that's the first step of our, of our uh, that's, the, that's the first step of our coupling. The second step is um, we're going to bound the difference in R work. And then that difference in R work, when we kind of pass it through the red arrows, we're going to get the desired uh, bound on the mean response time difference. So I'm going to I'm going to start by showing you how step one works. Step one isn't really strictly about coupling, um, but it's a cool relationship. Um, it's uh, and it, it, you can in a way you can think of it as a sort of new queuing identity um, that we actually think might be uh, might be very useful beyond just the MGK and the MG1. Might be useful in like load balancing systems and things like that. So, and I'm going to show you. Um, I'm going to. I'm going to uh, show you the proof for the SRPT case. Though the statement's the same in both cases. So, this the relationship between mean response time and mean R work is this. It's just an integral. 
over uh, if I integrate R work over R squared, uh, or expected R work over R squared from zero to infinity, um, I get the mean number of jobs in the system, which is uh, which. So if I divide by lambda, I get mean response time. And um, I, I like to I like to sometimes to write this uh, as I'm integrating with respect to one over R instead of integrating with respect to R. Um, and this makes the pictorial proof that we're about to draw a bit nicer. So, um, so this is the statement of the relationship between mean response time and mean R work. It, it, this is true under uh, SRPT and Gittins. It is true in a wide variety of queuing systems, all, um, which I can comment on more if people are curious. Um, but for now, let's just let's let's prove this. So, um, the way we're going to prove this is we're going to start by looking at one job's R work. So, um, I'm going to I'm going to ask. Okay, if I'm looking at one job, I'm going to ask. You know, for various values of one over R, how much R work does that job contribute for that particular value of R? And I'm drawing this with respect to one over R rather than R because that's what I'm integrating with respect to. And so if I kind of figure out how much R work I have for a particular job at every value of R, and I find the area under that curve, that's exactly what I'm looking for. So um, we're going to consider an arbitrary job. So if I've got known job sizes, um, what that means is I'm looking at a job of arbitrary remaining size x. So let's draw a job of remaining size x here. And I'm going to start by looking at r equals 0. So if r equals 0 and our job has non-zero remaining size, then it's not going to contribute any r work. And in fact, as long as r is less than x, then this job is going to be hidden by my r work classes. So whenever r is less than x, the R work contributed by the job is zero. And so what that means is that, um, so for small r, that means big 1 over r, specifically 1 over r bigger than 1 over x, I've got zero R work, no R work at all. So the, the curve is just zero uh, to the right of this dotted line. All right, now what happens if I look at r x or larger? Well, now the job is visible in my R work classes. And I know its remaining size is just x. So the job is visible. Its remaining size is x, which means the R work contributed by the job, if R is bigger than x, um, that R work is just x. And so this is the value uh, to the left of 1 over x. And so um, the kind of um, so the so I've got a function which is x to the left of 1 over x, and then zero thereafter. And so the area under that function is just one. Um, so, so now let's see. So, how does this help us when I'm looking at all jobs R work? Well, if I if I look at this function of R work with respect to one over R, right? What I'm doing here is I'm just integrating that function, right? Finding the total area. But I already know that you know this this R work is going to be made up of a bunch of jobs R work, and each of those jobs contributes a total area of one. And so what this means is that if I'm kind of looking at a random state, you know, a rand uh, uh, if I look at the system in steady state, then the expected area I'm looking at is just the expected number of jobs in the system, uh, which is just expected response time, or uh, times lambda. So that's, uh, so that's how we go between our work and mean response time, at least in the known size case. Um, in the general Gittins case, it's basically the same idea where each job contributes one. It's just you might not have a nice rectangle. It could be a weird, weird, weirder shape. OK, so that's uh, how our work relates to mean response time. So that's the kind of step one of our proof. We've done the vertical arrows. Let's now work on this horizontal blue arrow, which is um, bounding the difference uh, between mean R work between the system, right? We now see if, if we kind of look at this integral, right? We see we see that hey, mean response time is exactly linearly related to R work for various values of R. So if I can bound an R work difference, I integrate that difference, I'll get a mean response time difference. So 
Bef so re before jumping straight to an R work difference, I'm going to do a warm up. And I'm going to compute a difference between just the mean overall work between the MGK and the MG1. And so to think about, and so this is this step is really where the steady state coupling happens. And um, and kind of the reason we know, or the way you can tell that this is uh, this is kind of where the steady state information is getting used, is because we're going to think about work as a function of time, and we're going to observe that in a steady state system, right? If I'm, uh, you know, this is a random function, but if um, if at time zero w is is in its stationary steady state distribution. And it then it so then it's the same distribution for all times, which means that in a steady state system for any function f, the expectation of f of w is constant with respect to time. So here I'm not writing time implicitly, um, implicitly, but we uh, basically as um, uh, but uh, so like time is kind of implicit parameter of w here. Um, and so this is this idea of kind of looking at a steady state distribution, taking some function of it and saying, well, I'm in steady state. And so the uh, kind of expected change is zero with respect to time. That's actually the same key idea uh, that is used in Stein's method and the drift method. So the generator that Sid was talking about, that's just a way of formalizing this idea. Um, and whenever you say something, something, but Lyapunov function, something, something, you're using the same idea. <laughs> So what we're going to do here is we're going to pick a particular val particular function f. Specifically, f is uh, going to just square w. And we're going to see how that changes um, with respect to time. And, by, and specifically, we're going to compute the decrease and increase. And by equating them, we'll learn something. So, so the rate at which w squared decreases um, is we can. Uh, write that as 2e of bw, where here b, I've defined it this time, is this service rate that is the average fraction, the, sorry, the exact fraction of servers that are currently busy. So um, this decrease rate you get just from the chain rule, right? Uh, so the decreases are continuous. Um, and so you've got uh, the derivative of w squared is just 2w. And then b is the rate at which w itself is changing. So that's the decrease rate of W. The increases come not from kind of smooth decrease, but from jumps, specifically due to arrivals. And, um, and thanks to the Poisson arrival C time averages property, um, it's not too hard to compute what this increase rate is. It's um, basically uh, when a arrival occurs, it sees the steady state value of W, uh, but then it adds its size s to the system. And its size is independent of w. So here, these two w's are kind of the same w. This s is a kind of new job size independent of w. Um, and jobs arrive at rate lambda. So I'm going to spare you the computation. Um, we go through it in the paper in a kind of warm up section in the paper if you want to read the details. And what we find out is that e of w is this formula here. So you might recognize this first term as the classic mg1 pk formula. That is the amount of work in an mg1. And this second formula uh, has the same sort of 1 minus b uh, type thing that we previously saw when we talked about state space collapse in uh, JSQ. Uh, and I'm going to formally draw that, more formally draw that connection in a second. Um, but what, what I want you to think about now is why is this why is this the pk formula? Uh, put another way, why is this second term zero in the mg1? So, uh, so uh, actually, let's take take uh, take a minute so people in the audience can think about this. Uh, if you're watching this on, if you're watching the video after, pause the video and think about it. Why is this term zero in the MG1? All right. 
Anyone? Uh, all right, I'll, I'll take suggestions from the audience. Um, I guess you can leave a comment if you're watching this on the internet after. Um, any ideas for why this is zero in the MG1? I guess this is probably obvious for everyone else, so no one answers. But uh, for me, I'm thinking in MG1, either there is no work or no job or, or, or the server is busy. So that's ex yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, so um, yeah, so slightly more formally, in the MG1, this quantity 1 minus b times w is just always 0. And it's for exactly the reason that you don't said, is, is that um, if we've got any work at all, then we're going to be working at it at full, at full rate 1, right? That's what the MG1 does. Um, however, and, uh, and so what that means is that if w is greater than 0, then b equals 1. So 1 minus b is 0. So this product is just always 0. And so that's why the pk formula is this thing. So this, uh, you can actually think of this as like a kind of slick proof of the mean value uh, for the pk formula. So, But it gives a, yeah, David. A, a question or confusion. So if w is the total work in the whole system, not just the work on the servers, but since you only serve the people that are on the servers, I feel like I'm a little confused about why you get B times W in some sense. Like, because W is also the people that are waiting for service, I guess, right? Is that yeah. true? So and so that is, is true. Is that reasonable to be? To, well, one might think all that's relevant is how much is on the servers, at least as far as the very high level of the logic you're explaining. So why, why is that? Sure. So, um, so let me first state the kind of final formula, and then I'll kind of point at that as, we, as, okay. as I talk about that intuition. Yeah. So um, basically, by identifying this term as the mg1 amount, we get the following formula, uh, which relates the work in the mgk to, as the work in the mg1 plus this extra thing. So let's talk, so let's talk a little bit about, about this extra thing. So um, uh, I might be spoiling a few slides ahead, but that's OK. Um, so let's think about the MGK specifically. In the MGK, let's suppose that there are uh, more than, k, there are k or more jobs in the system, right? So that is, let's suppose all the servers are full, and so there might be jobs waiting in the queue. Yeah. What's true about B in that situation? B is one, so that is yeah. zero is your point. Yeah. So okay. it turns out that in the MGK, this term is only ever going to be talking about k minus one or fewer jobs. And so if you remember that k minus 1 in front of the O log 1 over 1 minus rho, that's where that sure. k minus 1 is going to come from. I see. Um, OK. Now yeah, that makes sense. OK, thank you. Yeah. And we'll talk about that in more detail in just a bit. Um, uh, now, you might this formula should, uh, should look familiar. Um, we saw a basically the same formula when we were comparing JSQ um, to, the MM, to the MM1 except we, had, we were looking at number in system rather than work in system. And uh, basically, if S is exponential, then if you're thinking about expected work, uh, well, that's just, it's a directly proportional to the expected number because of the memory this property of exponentials. Um, so actually kind of one, one theme of, uh, of this kind of, of the coupling that we introduced in this paper and we talk about this in the prior work section, is a lot of the time in prior work, people were kind of, people are really laser focused thinking about how many jobs are there of each particular type. Um, and, you know, they can analyze like, you know, systems with lots and lots of different types of jobs, and it gets really hairy. And if you shift perspective from thinking about number of numbers of jobs to thinking about total work, all sorts of stuff gets nicer. You know, you get you get these nice elegant formulas, and you're able to cover general size distributions, um, which is hard to kind of do directly if you're thinking about number. The last thing I'll note about JSQ is that in JSQ, 
this kind of, you can have more than K jobs in the system without B being one. So this formula is actually true beyond just the MGK. It also could work in like uh, various load balancing systems. So in the MGK, we're going to say, hey, this term always refers to at most K minus one jobs. Um, we think it can be applied more generally, in which case uh, you'll kind of need another strategy for bounding this term. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about how uh, we generalize that work difference to talking about our work. And I'm just going to state this for SRPT. It's basically the same thing for Gittins with just more notation. Um, and so we do the same strategy of we now think about our work as a function of time. And in the steady state system, we can say, you know, any function of our work uh, uh, in expectation, its expectation is constant with respect to time. And again, we're going to look at W squared. And again, we're going to do some computation, but you need to, uh, the, the process gets a little bit more complicated because there are more ways that our work can arrive. And you, at the end of the day, you get this pretty formula. And um, I'm not, it, you don't have to read this entire formula, but I'm just going to point out a few things. So the, for, most, for the most part, we just put R's everywhere. So this BK of R is just the service rate of jobs where I'm only counting service on jobs of size uh, less than or equal to R. Um, so these are only the jobs that contribute to our work. Similarly, this thing in the denominator, this lambda E of S for S less than R, you can think of that as like the R load of the system. So it's the load where if a job comes in, I'm only counting it if, it's all, if, it, if I see it through my glasses, if it has size at most R. So then the, the only sort of uh, kind of actually tricky change that happens when you're thinking about our work is let's think about a job that initially has size greater than R. If a job initially has size greater than R, then initially it's invisible to my glasses. But then as it receives service, at some point it will pass, um, it'll pass this threshold. Uh, it'll pass, uh, pass that threshold R and I'll start to see it. And so at the moment when that happens, at the moment when the job reaches remaining size R from above, I get, uh, I add some R work to the system. So this last term accounts for that. And this E sub R thing is an expectation sampled not in the steady state of the system, but at exactly those moments. Now that I'm looking at the slide, I'm also realizing there's a factor of R missing from that last term. But anyway, this is, this is the, uh, this is the basic idea. So, um, and so again, the point is that what we did for normal work, we can also do for our work. So what does this mean? What does this mean for response time? So I'm going to go back to the uh, simpler version of just looking at, just looking at ordinary work, just to get some intuition. So, um, but even for ordinary work, right? I've got this like funky term here, you know, what does this actually mean? So, um, as an illustration, let's suppose we're looking at a distribution with bounded job sizes, where all jobs are less than S max. So here, um, there are kind of two observations I'm going to make. The first is that I know the expectation of B, right? The expectation of B is, is rho, the average net fraction of servers that are busy. And so if I can kind of bound what WK is kind of independently of B, then I can get this one minus row canceling with that one minus row, and uh, I might be in business. So now let's think about uh, what we were talking about a few slides ago uh, in response to David's question, uh, where basically um, what we can observe is that if W, sorry, what we can observe is that if one minus B is not zero, that means B is less than one that means there's an idle server. And if there's an idle server, we've got at most k minus 1 jobs. And because each job has size at most s max, that means that inside this expectation, whenever this thing isn't 0, wk is bounded by k minus 1 times s max. And so I can upper bound this by just w1 plus, or e of w1 plus k minus 1 times s max. So, now, we may well be in a, in a system, though, where we don't have a uh, sort of bound on all job sizes. 
So this doesn't help us directly. But if we're thinking about SRPT, right? A job's R work is either zero or it's size. But again, we're only counting jobs of size at most R. So a job's R work is always at most R. And it turns out you can do basically the same type of argument. Again, it's more complicated because the expression is size and it's big, it's messy. But you get the same idea of that a job's R work, sorry, that the R work in a K server system is that in a single server system plus a term which is basically the R work of at most K minus one jobs, which is bounded by K minus one times R. Uh, it, if you kind of are keeping score and thinking back to that integral, uh, you might realize this isn't actually good enough. And so we prove a better round in the paper. And the uh, last thing I want to say is that this is true in a, uh, that R work is always less than R. This turns out to still be true under Gittins if you kind of look at it in, under the right conditional expectation lens. You can see the paper for details. So that is um, so that was step two of our proof, where we related the amount of R work between the two systems. And carrying that R work difference through the, uh, through the integrals and the red arrows, we get a difference between the mean response times of the systems. And so that's how we use a steady state coupling uh, between the MGK and this system with fewer constraints, uh, the MG1, um, to, uh, to get a bound on mean response in the MGK. Um, and this was kind of not possible using a sample path coupling, at least to the best of our knowledge. So, um, so I, just a, a few closing remarks. Um, so the kind of purpose of this tutorial um, was, or the way this tutorial came to be was uh, Sid and I were talking about research and we uh, kind of realized that, you know, we were doing things that looked very different um, on paper and looked very different if you looked at the equations. Um, you know, Sid was studying finite horizon problems. I was studying infinite horizon problems. Um, he was looking at, you know, this type of sample path coupling. If you were around yesterday, you saw it used all sorts of interesting dynamic programming type techniques. Um, I was looking at this, you know, um, I was looking at the steady state thing with, uh, which uses, uh, if you if you dive into the details of what we did a few slides ago, it, Turns out we're secretly using palm calculus. Um, so there's kind of lots of different threads being pulled. Um, but at a certain high level, it, we were kind of doing the same thing of solving a complex control problem by comparing to a simple one. And the more we talked to me, the more we realized that, hey, a lot of recent work in the Sigmetrics community and, and the broader um, sort of OR optimization community uh, has been following along this theme, especially these sort of recent breakthroughs with the drift method and state space collapse and with Stein's method. And so, and so we thought it might be good to kind of give a tutorial that sort of shows all of these different things happening at once um, to try and elicit some connections. Um, one connection, oh, you know, kind of baby first step connection that I showed you was the connection um, between the JSQ coupling with MM1 and a similar type of formula we saw when coupling the MGK to the MG1 under Gittins. So um, we hope this tutorial kind of gives you some ideas to kind of think, you know, think about coupling in your own life and your own research. If you have uh, kind of any questions about uh, this tutorial, any of the topics that they're in, um, or kind of ideas of places to go, feel free to send us mail. And uh, until then, hopefully coupling uh, can take the complex frowns in your life and turn them at least approximately upside down. And I think with that, we'll end the tutorial um, and take more questions. Um, I should also say thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, this has been really great to have you. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you are helping make this tutorial a lot better uh, with your participation. So thanks a lot, everyone. Really second that. I cannot imagine doing this without an audience. So this is awesome. Um, I guess we are free for questions. Yeah, I'll leave up a summary uh, slide uh, for this. Maybe one. Uh, I guess I, I've still been buzzing over this. Uh, like, do you have an intuition of like what was the sort of interesting property of our work, which like compared to just work, which made this easier? 
which allowed you to get these points? Sure. So the question is, what is special about our work compared to just overall work? So um, the main, there are, there are really two things that are special. The first, and, and it comes down to this diagram, um, where basically uh, the first is that our work, we're able to relate it to mean response time, right? The overall work doesn't have an obvious relationship to mean response time. The R work for any one value of R doesn't have an obvious relationship to mean response time. However, if you look at R work for all values of R and integrate them, only then do you get a relationship. In fact, you directly get the mean number of jobs in the system. Um, and so the kind of first interesting thing is that this sort of continuous quantity R work, when you integrate it, ends up counting a discrete thing, the number of jobs. Um, and ends up kind of giving insight into this discrete job by job thing of mean response time. Um, so that's the kind of first thing that makes our work tick. Um, the second thing uh, has to do with this blue arrow and uh, what I was saying here. So basically, um, over here, we have uh, that, you know, if we could have some, it's, it, what this is is basically a way to bound the sort of scary palm calculus difference term that we get. Um, and it's because each job's R work is at most R. So we actually need both of those things in order to make this whole argument work. And it's kind of lucky in a way that both end up working out. 